it was just plain and sad story that most people knew it, but they talked about it and just you don't know why it happened, man, that kind of stuff. So I love the history behind the stuff that's in scripture. Yeah. yeah. So when like see what I liked about what Paul did, he didn't divide. He saw everyone as you as you walked into Athens, he kinda of admired that all these people were worshiping people yeah. because he knew his sales pitch to to convert them. Yeah. Now if I was a go there and say you this you that but he embraced them yeah. and he but then he went to that idol that wasn't named and, and go ahead go ahead another history behind that no tell me tell me that's why okay. i want you <laughs> centuries earlier uh they took place in that in that city and all the sheep were dying okay and uh-huh. all the animals were dying and the famine was coming so they sacrificed the animals to every god they knew and nothing stopped so they finally put up a statue all over the place to the unknown god and then they sacrificed the unknown God and prayed to God. Mm. Okay? So when Paul comes on the scene, he says, I know the name of that unknown God, but his son. Mm-hmm. The one that he, he knew the history, the po- a poet, they call him a poet or a prophet. He knew the legend of the place. So he used that to evangelize them. And said, hey, there's only one God in there. I know it, and I know what it meant. Yeah. And then he, so he told them, and that's how he won them, by, by using their culture. He identified with, with, with where their heart was already yeah. at presently. And that's a great way to embrace someone and to yeah, bring them because forward I believe God out of choice. Those things in culture. Every culture has that niche. You can find what God already put in the culture, and you can open the whole culture up. Yeah. I had a friend whose name is John Garlock. I know he's dead. He died in the 90s. He was my mentor. He uh, he grew up in Montana, but in Africa. He was, he was I think he was older than me. He died in the 90s, late 80s. But uh, he, he had a missionary in Southeast Asia. In, in a small village uh, where he, they, had, they were just learning a written language. They just got a written language and they just were you know, working with it. But he was having such a hard time reaching the others. They wouldn't listen to him. They laugh at his stories. They thought him was silly, you know, all that. One day he's standing in the middle of a field and he's holding his Bible up and he's, he's, he's putting his page twisted in his hand. And he was angry. He was like, he's like a hole in the butt. And it opened up and he twisted backwards. He says, God, what am I going to do? I, I've spent years here and nothing, mm-hmm. nothing. He said, somebody saw that and went and told the chieftains and the tribe that the prophecy had been fulfilled. The man would hold a stalk or some kind of thing that would look like the, the, a, a written book. And anyway, it looked just like the, the legend. This man was standing holding this thing, and they wouldn't listen to him. Yeah. So all of a sudden, they started, he, he had to get to the root of it. Like Everybody came to his church the next day. Everybody was there, the chiefs and the village, and he was there with the Bible class. He was like, what happened? And they explained the story to him. That's all it took to open up that whole culture. Yeah. You know, he wrote it about in a book called Before the Pyramids. If you like that kind of stuff, I'll get you a copy of the book. It's yeah. About his, it's about his dad's journey in Africa. It tells him how to shrink a head. It talks oh. about all those things. Because the chieftain down there in Africa that was going to Canada, he got saved and came to believe. Yeah. And, uh, and, and then they wrote a book about it. They practice that uh, in Papua New Guinea, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Head hunters and things yeah, like that. He was that. in the island like that. We talked about this one of the Micronesia Islands, I believe that. I don't remember the name of it, but um, one of them over there. You know, they believe the Hawaiian culture came from Marquesa Islands. Okay. You know what I mean? And then, you know, they have a strong relation with Tahiti. Yeah. You know? Um, I hear Tahiti. Yeah. You know, and then, yeah. like, but with, you know, they believe master navigators of the ocean. Yeah. But the Vikings, man, are major master navigators prior to. Well, you know uh, Vasco da Gama? No. He sailed from Portugal, you know? Okay. From Rocco de Calvo. And he went to Japan. And, and the way we know the journey is because Portuguese language and Japanese language has a lot of the same words. Yeah. Like arigato and yeah. obrigado, it's the same word. Yeah. The Japanese word and the Portuguese word are mixed. So the Malaysian people, they believe, are the fourth race. They believe they're African, Asian, and European mixed. Because they look like all the different cultures. And yeah. They're in that island of Malaysia and Papua New Guinea and Malaysia, they call them the Orang Raiders. Yeah. So they have little bit bigger eyes, looser hair, red hair. It's really odd, but they have species of every race. Yeah. And it's really bizarre. But they believe that's, they believe Jets came there from their story. Yeah, and that's how the Gracie family learned Jiu Jitsu because they were trading with the with the Japanese yeah. and they speak Portuguese in Brazil. Oh, yeah, Portuguese. You know what I mean? So, and there's a heavy Portuguese population yeah, in Hawaii, Macau, Macau is also you know, um, but I could I could see how that transcended in terms of the martial art blend. Yeah, which, we had a good friend that was good friend of my son plays drums in his band. He was from uh, he was from uh, Hawaii. He was uh, half of Portuguese, Hawaiian, you know, came with the, he 
associate life. You didn't hear those music last night. You're hopping and going. Yeah. He actually shot himself that same film and had him for just about the tour. Yeah. Tour city in prison. Wow. Uh, to be with him. So with all your historical experiences, you didn't write no book, YouTube well, testimony, I, I and I've written one, but I haven't seen it. Uh, it's a gospel thesis I wrote for my thesis in my master's degree, and uh, but it's mainly it's mainly research on poverty. That's great, poverty. man. So I'm going to turn great. it into a book because I've done. I believe everything can be can reduced by what I call the covenant of model citizens. Uh, if you take the first five books of Moses, yeah, you can apply that to anything in life. It's, it's like who's in charge? Yeah. What are the rules? What happens if I keep the rules? What happens if I break the rules? And does this outfit have a future? So you can take those five points in your life or anything. So I'm going to take the book I've already written and apply those five points to it and look at the legacy books and the last books. What's the future? Okay, if this is how you get out of poverty, how does it apply to life in the sense of thinking? That's yeah. kind of where I'm at with it, but I haven't written it yet. Yeah. I haven't finished it. I finished about 150 pages and I got it. It's been published in the library in Texas, but I haven't turned it into a Book to, you know, like I'm gonna try to settle on the Yeah, I believe all these worldly experiences will pay off to whatever foundation, whatever you want to place your heart in, because that has matured and advanced you in terms of identifying with different cultures and especially keeping the God at the center of your heart and how to identify with people, like in terms of like how Paul had to identify and how yeah. different strategies to yeah and, and to advance the word. Thing, the thing you mentioned about Paul and culture, you know, Paul really was never a cross-cultural missionary, yeah. except in Galatia. Before that, the only place he went was the Roman world. Hmm. And, and when you read the scriptures, uh, you know, I had the fortune to be able to go to school and learn Greek and Hebrew and everything in the language of the Bible. Yeah. But, but a lot of times words in English, have, we, we translate them because it's the best way we can do it. But if you know more than one language, you know the things don't translate from that. So like in, in Romans, when Paul says this is the gospel which is known throughout the whole world, mm -hmm. the word there in Greek is oikonema. It's not the word cosmos. Cosmos means the planet, everybody. Yeah. Oikonema means the Roman world. Yeah. This is the gospel which is known throughout the Roman world, but we just translate the world. Yeah. And people get confused. Like, how did the gospel already reach the whole world? No, it only reached the Roman world because by the time Paul died, Great Britain had, had church. Yeah. So he reached the whole Roman world before he died. Not before the plan. Yeah. Uh, for those for you, there's, there's many words for the world. There's Terra, there's uh, uh, Axion, there's Cosmos, and there's Oikumena. And you got to know which world they're using. You know, just like in Romans 9 when it talks about the law, there's six different words for law used there. They're not talking about always God's law. Sometimes it's the law of Christ, sometimes it's God's law. Sometimes it's the spirit of man's law. And if you don't know the original language, it can be very confusing. So, uh, but if you need study tools, I can get you English study tools that'll show you how to translate those things. Yeah. You know, it has a number system in it, and you can look that up in a concordance. And that number for that word can look up what the Greek meaning is in English. Yeah, you know, that was one, one of the major languages clear. of the world, right? Latin and Greek was like the whole world was pretty yeah. much, that was their uh, and I modern day English. I that time to bring the sun to cross the earth. Uh, between Malachi and Matthew, which is 400 years, they call the silence of the Lord, spoke of God when he speaks to the prophets. Whether that was true or not, I don't know. The months and the sun was different. But if you look at world history during that time, the whole world was transformed into a Romanized language. Even Egypt, the last pharaoh, hmm. the son of Hammer, you know, he uh, translated hieroglyphics into a Romanized alphabetized language. So no place in the Roman world or the known world could not receive the gospel. Wow. And it wasn't classical Greek. It was called what they called Koine Greek, which would be kind of like street talk. You know how we have it in phonics, it's true English. Yeah. That slang, that's what Paul taught you. Point of Greek, not classical Greek. Yeah. You know, so so it was known throughout the whole world. That was what the common language of the street was. Was, mm -hmm. was the, even the Roman world, they spoke Point of Greek. Roman the Roman Latin language used to clear things from higher philosophy and those kind of things. Yeah. You know. But uh, there's a lot of stuff. If you're interested in that kind of stuff and, and are you good on reading everything? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. There's a lot of stuff I could get you to read on that if you're interested. Because I love the history of like the Tyndale and his book and how the Bible came to be and, and those kind yeah, of things. Yeah, I like the root of uh, the thinking process because you could have, you could apply and identify that with the modern, you know, uh, there's a lot of strategies. Do you get podcasts on your phone? Uh, I do the Wi-Fi stuff, but I don't, you, you know, 
also just to mention podcast. There's a guy named George Brown out of Franklin, Tennessee, yeah. an older guy. Yeah. And he has a he does a bunch of podcasts on history of the of, of the New World of the Western World. Okay. And he he does some like on different different individuals like Cotton Mather, who uh, everybody thought was a guy because the Salem witch trials, but he never attended one of them. But he did affect our culture. He was like the he was like the spiritual father of the founding fathers. Mm-hmm. You know? And over half the founding fathers were godly men that hated slavery and never owned slaves. Yeah. You never hear all that. Now, yeah. Half of his, George Washington, owned slaves. His best friend was Marquis de Lafayette. And Marquis de Lafayette's French. And he begged Washington in letters, let the slaves go. Hire some of these employees. Be an example to the country. Because he eventually, you know what happened to him. Yeah. You know? And because he was still on May 15th, 1214, when the uh, Fair Pick Amendment and Magna Carta was written, since 1235, uh, in it, it talks about doing away with slavery in Magna Carta worldwide. No one wants to do it. Kill some guy. Yeah. And that's what our system is founded on. And then even uh, later on, with uh, Rose William Wilberforce, I don't know if you ever heard of William Wilberforce. No, I just did. He was a congressman in the House of Commons in London, but also a minister. And he tried to introduce the Bill against slavery in the British Empire for four years. And then with all these failings, on the, the, the week of his death, it was accepted and passed in Congress. And it became, they had to free all the slaves throughout the, the British Kingdom. That was in the late 1700s. You know? uh, so it was after America was founded, somewhere between 1770 and early 1800s, but it finally passed. But he was, he was an incredible fellow. I mean, the things he stood for and did, you know, you don't really hear about it. Usually when you hear the negative stuff, you got to look back. You don't hear the good stuff. Yeah. And none of these men are perfect. None of us are perfect. Yeah, yeah. You, know, you can read stuff by one guy at one time and read something later. It's a totally different story. Well, it's because at that point, that's how he was. He just didn't change. Yeah, that's why I believe in um, observing and recognizing everyone's struggle because if you could actually apply and learn how to remove oh, yeah. oppression from your society, oh, yeah. I don't care if it's in Africa or around the world, if you could identify it with loving heart, you could easily relate, you know. So the Salvation Army started in uh, France? Uh, London, 1865. London? London? A guy named William Booth. He was yeah, a white man. pastor. He went out in the streets, broke up and sold people to the homeless in the streets. Yeah. And after it was grown large enough, I think they were up to 3,000 every, every week, they started calling them an army. Mm. And, and they were called Salvationists. <laughs> and they were Salvation Army. So it's yeah. Really it was based on Matthew 25. Most people hear about Matthew 28. Yeah. Where all the world will preach the gospel, all creation, all the all the in the age, all power, all authority, mine. But in Matthew 25, Jesus says, one day I'll return and judge the nations, and I'll bring before me all the people and all the nations, and I'll separate them based on sheep and goats. Yeah. And, and the sheep are the ones who took care of the naked, took care of the blind, fed the hungry, fed the prison, and worked with all these people. The goats are the ones who didn't do it, and Jesus says, the reason I'm going to judge so harshly is because what have you done to your brethren? You've done it unto me. Yes. You know, and that's what Salvation Army was founded on, was trying to help people physically help people and preach the gospel because they don't reject anybody who rejects the gospel. They're still going to help you regardless. Any level they can, unless you're like trying to burn somebody down. But yeah, other than that, they're yeah. going to try to work you. If you're trying to oppress someone, they, they, they may be a little, little, but they're still going to try to help. Yeah. If you need a blanket, that oppressor, here, here goes a blanket, but yeah. you know, we're going to make sure you don't try to oppress no one in our presence right now. Yeah. But that's love though, you know what I mean? Because that'll, that'll like convert someone's heart like to make them go, you know what? That person, he didn't agree with me. And he knows what my wicked actions are of, but he still allowed me to preserve myself by giving me a blanket, bread, yeah. and that right there will make a person rethink the choices in their life and start so bodyguarding God, people. We can be repentant for loving God. Yeah. Sometimes the love is a hard word. It's like, you need to stop doing heresy, bro. I mean, sometimes you got you to be love. clean. How can you be sloppy? It's like, that's, sometimes that's a hard word, but it's good to be loved. Yeah. It comes based on the spiritual life. Yeah. You know, the word talks about salvation. It's physical. Emotional and spiritual, all yeah. three parts of the human being. God wants to save us, but He wants to save you physically too. You know, He wants to save every temple. You know. Yeah. May I shake your hand, brother? Oh yeah, yeah. And you know, hey, I'll be honest, bro. I've been filming this the whole time. <laughs> this guy right here is a wise of knowledge. He's my new friend. Uh, can you introduce yourself, please? My name is Mike Bowen. Yeah. Nice and, to meet uh, whoever you play this to. This is all the friends from Hawaii and Guam. You know, people I'm trying to reach out to. <laughs> but I'm just saying, you know, if you're genuine in heart, God will lead you in a way to make you be genuine in a place to where if you keep choosing of the few temptations, you know, you'll gain a lot of wisdom and maturity if you choose and seek it. And that's what Mike has brought me today. Big law for that, brother. You know, just to let you know, arm yourself with a strong spirit and uh, keep, keep
keep uh, your strong faith with God and continue to walk because we're all never alone, man. We're all going to return. Yeah, we're going to pass the blessing, man. You know what I mean? Thank you, big Aloha.